concerned about our definition of learning. From watching over the last 60 years, a number of different educational innovations and reforms take place in our public education system that our critics still say aren't working and our public schools aren't working. And that has always bothered me. And it finally came to me in two different ways. I won't describe where I was and what I was doing when I had this insight. Because <laughs> you really don't want to know. But the first part of it was the evaluation process. Our whole evaluation process of measuring learning is corrupted. And it's corrupted because we are confusing the acquisition of learning and the performance. So the first thing that came to mind is how do we separate the act of learning from a performance? I went to, I have three different dictionaries in my office and I went to them and got the current generally accepted definition of learning. Every one of them requires a performance as a part of the definition. And it occurred to me that our current learning theory is dependent upon 150 years of research on mice, rats, pigeons, chimpanzees, maybe a few humans somewhere along the line, but not very many. Because our current learning theory is based on how we condition animals. And at a time when we had no way to look inside the skull to see what was going on. We had to have a stand-in for what we want to define as learning. And that stand-in now, to make this, get this shorter, is that we have come to the point of using a two-digit or three-digit number to assess someone's learning and, and also intelligence which is another term that we really have never defined very well. The only generally accepted definition is that which the intelligence test measures. And that doesn't help us very much. And our learning definition doesn't help us very much either. Now, Brad and I changed what we were going to do today after two beers at the bar last night. So you learned a different way. Right. <laughs> Not <laughs> and, and so I'm going to flip through a number of, of slides that I intended to use to, to give you some background and some context for this, but I'm going to go right to the definition. And why it, first, why redefine it? Because how we define learning affects understandings about how and what is learned and to what extent learning is accomplished. And the work that I've been engaged in and others explores and encourage others to explore a new neurocognitive definition of learning. Because we now know a lot more about what's going on in the brain than we did 50 years, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, when cognitivism really started. But here's the definition, and it's not intended to be a definition to, that we're going to vote on and accept, but a definition intended to get the thinking started about how important it is to recognize that the definition of the terms we use drive everything else we do, from the planning, from the delivery, from the evaluation. And those aspects of our work are all driven by the definition. And so I'm offering this only as a place to begin, not as a place to end. And I'm offering it mainly because the tools that we've been using the last 60, 70, 100 years are crude, unreliable, and not very valid. And I'm beginning to have confidence in the tools that we're going to see neuroscientists create in the future are going to offer us non-invasive ways to see what really is going on inside the brain. A 
recent book by Neil deGrasse Tyson, which I hope most of you recognize his name. The title of the book was Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Now, I didn't get this from him. But he talks about in the last chapter how much they've learned about the universe over the last hundred years but how little what we've learned represents what we need to learn. And he's advising neuroscientists to, to reflect humility rather than the arrogance and the humility that's associated with what we know about learning is so small, but it's going to grow exponentially over the next decade or two. And the it's going to be driven by the kinds of tools that are going to be developed that allow us to see what's going on. A couple of weeks ago, there was an article by an anesthesiologist in the University of Arizona who thinks he's located where consciousness is inside the brain. He often wondered when he put people under, the brain still functions but they were not conscious. He's discovered through a, an amazing telescope or microscope that inside the cell covering are things he called tubules. And these are little tiny canals that information, he believes, is being processed by the brain, which is the state where the state of consciousness is. So we're seeing a whole lot of research that really is fueling the notion that we've got a long way to go and that the definition of learning has got to be separated from the performance of the task. And it's up to us to really try to figure out how do we do that because we're so tied to performance. And that's my cue. <laughs> 